Now, to fully grasp the extent of this story, we first have to go back to the past. All the way in the heart of Japan, back in 1979. Japan's economy was booming, its society was changing by the day, and manga was becoming more popular than ever. And at manga publisher Young Magazine, a young mangaka artist, Katsuhiro Otomo, is working on his first science fiction manga. Its name is Fireball. The story is about a group of freedom fighters who band together to take on a tyrannical government. It would be the work that would set in stone the themes and motifs of his later mangas. Unfortunately, Otomo got tired of writing Fireball by page 20, and he left it unfinished. His next major project would be called Domu, a manga about psychic children and all sorts of other craziness, which I highly recommend. Domu wound up winning the Nihon Science Fiction Taisho Award, which is basically the Japanese equivalent of the Nebula Award. Domu was the first manga to ever win it, and cemented Otomo as a major player in the manga industry. Now looking back at these two works, it seems like they were both a rough draft for something that would later come to affect Otomo's life in a big way. Take the Freedom Fighter story from Fireball, and mix it with the psychic children from Domu, and you've got yourself the granddaddy of cyberpunk manga, Akira. The story of Akira is batshit crazy, so let me give you the lowdown. Oh, and by the way, this will be the continuity of the manga, because the anime's plot is way different, but more on that later. It begins on December 6, 1992, or July 16, 1998, as it was in the anime, but like I said, manga continuity. An explosion suddenly ignites and destroys all of the city of Tokyo, initiating World War III. Later, in 2030, all of Tokyo has been repaired and transformed into Neo-Tokyo. One night, a gang of bikers sneak into the city's Ground Zero site, led by their leader, Shotaro Kaneda. Heading back to the city, Kaneda's best friend, Tetsuo, ends up in a motorcycle crash after nearly hitting a young, deformed child. When Kaneda goes to investigate the young boy, he suddenly disappears, shocking him. And then the government arrives and takes Tetsuo away. And the story gets even crazier from there. The manga ran serialized on Young Magazine from 1982 until 1990, spanning over 2,000 pages, each of which were collected into six separate volumes. That's as much as I'm gonna say from here. I seriously recommend that you read the manga. It doesn't matter if you hate manga or love it, Akira is a great piece of fiction. And while the movie is great on its own, it feels more like a companion piece to the manga than it does an actual completed film. Regardless, I think both are worth your time. Although he never intended to do so, Otomo was later approached to adopt the manga into an anime. Otomo was at first hesitant, as he only really thought of Akira as a manga, and in the past had issues of creative control working on movies. Eventually, however, he gave in, and the Akira Committee was created, gaining much support from several industries to turn the manga into a masterpiece. With Otomo directing the film, as well as having a budget of 1 billion and 100 million yen, a brilliant animated production team by TMS Entertainment, and a masterful soundtrack by the Japanese music collective Gaino Yamaashiro Gumi, Akira was soon born. It was a dream that I saw. A dream? The city started to crumble apart, covered by a big shadow, and lots of people died. <laughs> and the three of us, we get to meet Akira again. What? Akira? <laughs> What the hell is this Akira thing, huh? I think it's no secret to anyone that Hollywood is trying to pull its weight. In a constant stream of sequels, 
remakes, reboots, and soft reboots, the industry is desperately looking down the bottom of the barrel for a box office hit, and recently, it's looked toward the east, attempting to adapt Japanese anime. Because you know, anime, that's popular now, right? I mean, it's not that they're wrong. We're a generation that grew up on anime, especially with the help of programming blocks like Toonami or 4Kids, and Hollywood knows this and they want to bank on it. Anime itself is a niche medium, and it still has some stigma toward it as being nothing but Japanese devil tunes. Which it isn't, that's just ridiculous. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of anime, at least not as much as I was as a kid, but I know anime fans can be very protective of their fandoms, and I can understand this discourse against Hollywood adapting the works they like. Film is a mainstream medium that has a lot of influence on the collective of society. No one's going to go out of their way to watch a 200 episode anime series, but would definitely spend time watching a 2 hour movie. What they see in that 2 hour movie will affect their general perception of the material brought to them. Anime fans don't want their works to be misrepresented. It seems like Hollywood has no general understanding of anime as a genre or as a fandom, but of course, this has always been a reoccurring element with anime translating to the West. When we were kids, most of the localized anime we watched on TV were heavily edited lies that scarred the original source material. Whether it was mistranslating the original text, changing the personality of characters or the context of certain scenes, or completely eliminating the original soundtracks which is downright blasphemy. It's the reason why Sailor Uranus went from being a lesbian to a cousin, or why Bardock was once said to be a great scientist in the ocean dub, and why Shun... Shun... Ah, oh, fuck. Shun... Shunsuke Kikuchi. Shunsuke Kikuchi's score was replaced with Bruce Falkner's for Dragon Ball Z. Western dubbing markets just didn't care. As long as it turned to profit, they could have cared less. Although, in recent years, they've improved tremendously. That's sort of where Hollywood is at the moment. A Western dubbing market that has the unfortunate task of dubbing anime and pleasing its unpleasable fanbase. And they are doing a rotten job. Recently, we've had the live-action Death Note and live-action Ghost in the Shell movie. <laughs> Neither of them are good. The Death Note movie felt like Adam Wingard wanted to make a completely different movie about a guy who ends up dating a psychopath. But when he saw that no studio would buy that script, he instead slapped the name Death Note onto it. And the live-action Ghost in the Shell felt like a fast-food version of Blade Runner. Boring and pretentious, but pretty nice visuals. Now I know what you might be wondering. If I don't care about anime as much as I used to, then why am I talking about this? Well. It's because there's one project that's rather infamous among anime fans, as well as myself, and it hasn't even been made yet. In fact, it's a project that doesn't seem to want to die, no matter what happens to it. But unfortunately, seeing as how I've been editing non-stop for the past two weeks, I'm afraid we're gonna have to wait until part two of the history of the live-action Akira movie. Okay, uh, this video took way longer than expected. I think I've been editing for the past two weeks, and I've only gotten to eight minutes. But you can blame that on work and school. Uh, so, until, you know, this channel starts blowing up, uh, I'm afraid that's gonna be the schedule. But, uh, don't you worry, because I have a lot more other content coming along the way, and, uh, part two will be here soon enough, once I, uh, learn all I need to know and uh, get all my facts together. I'm actually a bit disappointed at, on how this video turned out because I feel like I didn't put enough information on there, but oh well. So uh, if you like what you've seen so far, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button because I really, really, really want this to <laughs> be successful. And uh, I, I hope you liked it because I worked very hard on it. This is Daniel of Metropolis Pictures signing off.